Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to a new episode of your favorite podcast, the Thoth Hermes podcast. This is episode 12 of our season four. It is Sunday, March the 22nd, 2020. What a year. And this episode bears the title of Models of Magic and whoever has already maybe heard that expression Models of Magic might guess who our guest is today. Well, you don't need to guess actually, just go on Facebook and see who I announced and it is Frater UD, one of the great names of European magic, of worldwide magic we could say of our time. So Frater UD will be with us in a moment. For the moment, I would like to say thank you to all of you who have come here to listen again to this week's episode. And you are becoming more and more numerous each week. And this makes your host Rudolf, that's me, really happy. Thank you for all that. If you need more information either about this show, about the show notes, if you want to have a look at them, if you want to go back and see all other kinds of shows that have been on this podcast already and find the show notes of all of them too, if you want to send me feedback maybe or all other issues regarding to our website, Go to our website, that is thothermes.com, and that is spelled T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S dot com. It's great to have you here, and thank you to all of you who are returning listeners, and welcome to all of you who are here for the first time. If you've been around here last week, you might have listened also to the wonderful interview I did with David Beth then. And if you follow me on Facebook, you already know that given so many of you have come back to me and to David with further questions and wanting more input about what he had to say last week, we have decided to create a special Q&A episode with David in the near future. So please send me all your inquiries and your questions and your further interests in what David had to say in episode 11 last week and send them to me on info at thothermes.com until Easter. That will be April the 10th. So all those questions, we will then select those who we can answer within an hour or so. And we will try to answer as many of them as possible. Once again, this is regarding episode 11, last week's episode with David Beth and all further questions that you would like to forward to him. Send me an email on info at thoughtshermes.com or if you wish, you can also post me a message on Facebook. Great. Well, well, don't we live in quite difficult and strange times though. Well, I hope all of you are as well as possible and that you live up to what's facing us at this moment. Especially, I hope that all of you are in good health and those who are maybe suffering from that coronavirus, we wish you all the best and get well soon again. And also to those who are, and there might be quite a few who are economically hit by what's going on all across the world because of that virus, we really hope that you are doing as good as possible. Just stay tight, it'll all return 
as quite soon we all hope that end. There are so many of you and so many occultists, so many people who work that the world is getting better again. And there's also real help that comes from many sides. Um, and that's quite a nice thing to see. Of course, there are also um, things that we regret. For example, I announced last week that uh, a Magical Women Conference in London will take place this year in June uh, and that the Thoth Hermes podcast will also be a, have a collaboration with that wonderful uh, conference. Well, and a few days after that, um, Ersebeth Bartold, who is one of the two uh, leaders of that conference, she contacted me to say we have to reschedule. This year's conference has been rescheduled for next June, June 5 and 6, 2021, for obvious reasons. And I think this was a wise decision, Ersebeth and Sue, um, what you did there. But um, uh, it, we all regret that. But for sure, and uh, I say that quite clearly, the Dot Hermes podcast will also be with you next year on the Magical Women Conference. So there will be our presence at the conference itself. And also, of course, there will be a very special episode after the 2021 conference to talk about London Magical Women Conference. Erzimet is, by the way, also the uh, owner and she runs Hadian Press, one of those great occult publishers. And, um, well, she and others, they also give help to their customers in very special ways. There are special treats on the website, for example, of Hadian Press, free downloads of some interesting booklets so that you can fill your time while you are in that splendid isolation that most of us are at the moment. And Hadian Press is not the only one to do that. I can also tell you that Anathema Publishing from Montreal, for example, is reducing their uh, their transport fees, I believe it is. And it's also Theon Publishing we talked about with David Best last week. They also have special offers at the moment for all the clients so that you can still afford and get your books. And let's not forget that by buying books from all those people, and I only named those three, but there are many others around who wait for your support. And we support them by buying books now. And at the same time, we can fill the time that we have at hand at the moment. So be generous, be open, go buy books, help each other, and let's all together get out of that crisis strengthened and with new hope for the future. Well, I don't normally talk about those things at length, but I think at the moment it's really important. One other thing I have to say, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a long intro, but anyway, I tell you right away, this is going to be a bit of a long episode because my talk with Fratr UD, it was so interesting and he was in such a talkative mood that evening when we spoke. Um, the interview is 93 minutes long and that's great. I think it's the longest interview I've done ever on this show. And for that reason, I split it in three parts this time. So we'll have two breaks in the middle, but we come to that a little bit later. I wanted to talk about, well, of course, also helping at the Thoth Hermes podcast. You know that we have a Patreon site here and we also have a donation button on our website. And once again, I would like to ask you to become a patron, to support the show, especially in times like this. We need your support because we also will have to cover our costs for the upcoming weeks and months and life is at the moment difficult for all of us. So there is that special tier on the Patreon site, which with $1 per episode will support this. And I think $1 would really something that many many could afford and it would be really nice. I don't usually talk about figures, but I once wanted to give you an idea what I'm talking about, um, because you might have uh, not even thought about that. Um, at the moment, the Thought Hermes podcast, we have about 
2,500 listeners a week, which I'm extremely happy about. That's twice as much than about three months ago. And that's also because we do a weekly show now. And I think you really started liking us more and more. And I really thank you for that. I also want to thank all of those who have already supported the Thought Hermes podcast. But I wanted to give you that figure. So it's 2,500 listeners per week. And we have eight, eight patrons on Patreon. So no need to say more, don't I? Would be nice if there were a bit more than those eight out of 2,500. So go to the website, click on that Patreon button and become a supporter. One dollar, you can give more, but at one dollar per episode, it starts and it is urgently needed, especially those days. Thank you for that. And thanks to all of them, again, who already are supporting us. Okay, let's go to that interview. But before that, of course, there will be some music as always. I just told you this episode has a bit of a special format with that really long interview today with Frater UD. Very interesting interview. And as we all have a bit more time at hand, at least most of us, I don't think you will mind that we are a bit longer today. Well, I hope so. Um, because of this, uh, I will play four pieces of music because we'll take two musical breaks in between the interview. And as always, before we start the interview, we will have a first piece of music. Well, the music choice that I have for you at hand today is a bit eclectic and I like being eclectic about music, you know that. The first piece we're going to hear is by someone who has already been on this show twice. It is Heather Dale, Canadian singer-songwriter, and she has just released a brand new single called In Principio, and she has been very kind to offer me the possibility to play it for you here. Um, I might just read her a few lines she, when she talks about that very meditative, very um, calm song. She says, with all the changes going on to help contain the coronavirus this week has been full of upheaval. So we need a little moment of calm and time to find our strength. So she has been creating a new song with, with, where she's improvised several long meditative incantations which are intended to ground and center our spirit and freeing our mind to wander. In principio, that's Latin for in the beginning and now we are at the start of this new musical journey with Heather Dale. It's her brand new song, In Principio. Enjoy. Thank you. 
Heatherdale's brand new single, In Principio, was the first piece of music in today's show. Models of Magic is the name of this show, and we are now very happy to welcome a great man, Frater UD. Frater UD is a writer, poet, and above all, a magician. He has so many years of experience as a magician, but also as a translator, interpreter. He has authored more than 40 books, and many of them have really become modern-day classics. We remember 
High Magic, probably that thing in two volume, which taught many of us their first steps in ceremonial magic or practical sigil magic, which was at the very beginning of what sigil magic has become. And his works have been translated into many languages up to Russian, Estonian and Japanese. And he's very well known for his undogmatic approach to black arts. He translated works by Peter Carroll, Alistair Crowley, etc., etc., you name it. I don't think we need to introduce him. I'm a very lucky guy because I know Frater UD in person and it is not only nice to meet him uh, here on the interview uh, electronically, so to speak, but it's always nice to meet him in person. And this time, as I said earlier, we talked for 93 minutes and I'm sure you're going to enjoy Enjoy that. He's full of experience. We are going to talk about his life, basically, about the colorful path his life took. And when we talk about his life, there are so many other questions and things that arise that we were really talking along. Um, and it was it was a nice a nice evening that I passed with him on the microphone. Okay, we will take two breaks. I already have said that to you, and I will keep this intro now rather short because I have been talking for much too long in the first intro already. Um, as we have two breaks and four music pieces today, it might be even more important than usual to remind you that this podcast also uses chapter marks. So if you want to jump forth and back between parts of the interview or to a certain musical piece, you can if your podcast player supports chapters. Most of them do nowadays. So have a look at that. Immediately after the first part of this interview, which lasts about 35 minutes, I believe, um, we will have a musical break and start immediately into the first piece without further to me talking. Um, and this piece is, I told you, I'm going to be eclectic today, a piece called Ancient Egyptian Music. It's not real ancient Egyptian music, of course. It is by contemporary composer Derek Fichter, who has written a piece called Pharaoh Ramses II, dedicated to that great pharaoh and who picks up the mood of ancient Egypt in his music. So you will hear that after the first part of that lovely interview with Frater UD, and we are now straight going into that talk. Here comes the interview. Hello. Today on the Thoth Hermes podcast, we have a guest that I'm have really been looking forward to have him uh, on this show for quite some time. And it's somebody who I think you, our listeners, are also very keen to hear talk to us today. Uh, I would like to welcome here on this show, Frater UD, who is probably one of the most marking personalities of contemporary magic in, in our time. Um, welcome, Frater UD. It's a great pleasure to have, uh, have you here with us today. Well, Gruel, thank you very much for the invitation. You're running a very nice gig here, as I see, and uh, it's certainly <laughs> worth everyone's time. And uh, so I'm very happy to contribute. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to hear that. Um, Frater UD, um, maybe let's, before we start with any other question, let's clear that question about that UD, Frater UD. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I think some of our listeners might have asked themselves already, what does UD stand for? Well, it's an abbreviation of my magical mm. motto, which is in Latin, and the uh, motto is ubiquidium, ubiquidius, in a more or less English uh, pronunciation of Latin, mm -hmm. or as we tend to say it in German, ubiquidem on ubiquidius. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it actually means um, the demon is in everything and the god is in everything, which uh, right. is basically my way of saying or of tas tasking myself to actually always uh, try to see all sides of the matter, not just two sides of a coin, because as I said in some other interview, coins with only two sides do not interest me any longer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> basically trying to, in to grasp things as a whole as far as we are able to which of course 
is quite a different problem. So that's that why I adopted that basically right early on in my magical career, if you want to call mm -hmm. it that. Mm -hmm. And I first stuck to it. And uh, I don't really see any reason why I should uh, uh, change that. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, well, thank you for that, because I think that was important. And um, well, you were just talking about your magical career and a career it certainly is in your case. Um, but where did it all start? Uh, where did you did you start at a very early age, as many of, of you and your colleagues do? Or is it is it something that came to you at the later stage? How did you become the fraud or UD that you are today? Where did it all start? Well, uh, it did actually started rather at a rather young age, with nine. Uh, basically, the my impetus was uh, a broke uncle. <laughs> a guy, a, he was a, you know fairly young at the time, and uh, uh, he was a married relative, so not by blood, and uh, he wasn't doing particularly well economically. Mm -hmm. But he was very much into you know positive thinking and that kind of stuff, and very mm -hmm. enthusiastic about it and when I was nine years old that was a time when he had just discovered yoga and so he went on and ranted about yoga all the time and I found that very interesting so uh, uh, out of my pocket money I went out and bought my first book on yoga when I was nine and uh, plus another book on uh, auto hypnosis and hypnosis in general which was a more technical uh, thing uh, and then, uh, well, my father was with the German Foreign Office, so uh, basically, I grew up as a as a diplomatic brat uh, born in Egypt, and um, he was posted then to Sudan, Khartoum, Sudan, and mm -hmm. uh, we went there. We traveled there by freighter, so that was several weeks uh, on high sea. And that's where I basically started digging into that yoga stuff. And uh, it has never really left me since. For the first about 10 years, I was, you know, looking here, sniffing there, investigating this and that. But more or less on a, on a reading level, not, not so much on a practical uh, level. Right. Except for, for, a, for a short while, I was in Pakistan at that time uh, when I discovered Lobsang Rampa, that old charlatan. But of course, at that time, I didn't know he was a charlatan. <laughs> And he had uh, one of his books, I read about 12 of his books, uh, one of it uh, was basically a, a cause, you know, on uh, what we would call today, uh, you know, uh, uh, psychic powers, you know, like telepathy and uh, dream control, astral travel and all that. And I did some exercises uh, on that as well. Had my first astral projection. Then uh, mm -hmm. saw myself lying, you know, from from the ceiling, sort of. Saw myself lying on the on the bed, and uh, it was such a awful shock. Later on, I read that lots of other people have experienced that same shock as well. But it was such an awful shock that I really shot back into my body, and I was unable to do that for at least another. 15 years or so. Really? Re repeat that, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, even though I'd been warned, I mean, he was quite open about it and uh, I found it very interesting and fascinating nonetheless, but whatever I tried after for years <laughs> on end, uh, it simply wouldn't work anymore. Uh, I investigated... Well, it's a Eastern philosophy a lot more than Western, uh, the Western tradition initially. For about 10 years, I was very much at home, you know, in Vedic scriptures and Buddhist mm -hmm. literature and uh, uh, because it sort of seemed to ring a bell with me. And right. uh, so uh, I only discovered the Western tradition a lot later on. I was at un in university at the time in Bonn, studying Bonn, Germany. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, well, one day, uh, to cut a long story short, I, I hit upon, uh, well, Alistair Crowley. I hit upon actually a lot of the English uh, magicians at the time, you know, English uh, magical yeah. authors. That yeah. was in the 70s. Like, like, like who, like Westcott or Dro that age or a little younger than that? No, they're, they're young, no they're actually the, the, the current ones more, you know. Right, the, right. The right. range, and you know, from friend, Butler and, and yeah. Diane Fortune to, right. to Gray and uh, later on David Conway and Francis mm -hmm. King and, mm -hmm. and this, that and the other. Plus, uh, yeah, well, I was... You know, at university studying English uh, as a major subject, English literature, and I was actually 
uh, thinking about uh, writing my doctor's thesis in English. It never came to pass, but mm-hmm. uh, what I suggested to my professor was writing on an occult topic. And uh, apparently my professor, I mean, that was very much a no-no uh, kind of topic at that time in academia. <laughs> Because, uh, uh, I, I mean, I asked several professors about it. One of them told me, yeah, you know, uh, well, we were investigating uh, William Butler Yeats and uh, yeah. and his, uh, well, I, I came to him at the end of a seminar and said, well, how about the vision? I mean, Yeats took about 17 years to write that book and it was basically all channeled by his wife, Georgie Hyde Lees. And mm-hmm. it was all about magic and metaphysics and so on. And he just shrugged it off and said, well, you know, this is nothing but Neoplatonism, forget it. Uh, Well, I beg to differ. Anyway, I found another professor uh, who was actually amenable to that. And then I had an excuse. So when I crossed the channel the next time and went to Ford's bookshop, apparently they just restocked their Crowley library, uh, or, well, what their offerings on the shelf. And basically, I bought the entire (laughs) shelf. (laughs) <laughs> stock of crony books they had uh, available uh, to take home and uh, because now I had an excuse you know to actually uh, you know I was actually working in academically on my doctor's thesis mm-hmm. and at the same time I was uh, I had actually had to read Alistair Crowley and other magical authors Sure. But uh, what really struck me on the practical level, struck me a lot more and more immediately, was uh, actually discovering uh, Austin Osmond Spare right. uh, via Kenneth Grant at the time, of course. And um, because uh, that was some stuff that I then really started to experiment with. And uh, I had some very well, weird, sometimes hair-raising experiences with sigil magic. And that's mm-hmm. what got me finally hooked, you know, rather than uh, sniffing around here doing that and testing out that and this and other approaches. Uh, you know, I'd been into, uh, into a very strict regime of uh, of uh, tantric yoga for quite a, quite some time. And mm-hmm. uh, I was familiar with the Krishna, uh, ISKCON, uh, Krishna consciousness movement. I was never a member, right. but, but I visited them fairly extensively and uh, spent time in their temples and this, that, mm-hmm. and the other, doing kirtan on the on the streets of Saint Saint Pauli in Hamburg in the red light district, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and stuff like that. Wow. And uh, so, but 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 uh, sigil magic is what actually finally got me hooked and. Uh, and I've heard, never, never really looked back since then. Well, and sigil magic is something that you that really made you also for the first time, I think, known a bit uh, among among the people who read books and know about other magicians, right? So sigil magic was was it's kind true. Of it's it's one because. of. It. Mm. I mean, uh, I set up uh, together with two. Uh, to uh, other uh, student colleagues uh, from university, I set up an esoteric bookshop in Bonn in 1979. All right, and uh, that is well. We'll we'll probably talk about this later with the Bonn uh, workshop for experimental magic, which came from that. But which actually came from that as well was uh, later on the the German magazine Unicorn, which was about well magic and mythology and spirituality and new age and this uh, and that. And my mm-hmm. very first article, which I wrote under the name of uh, Frater UD, mm-hmm. uh, was about actually Austin Osman Spare and his sigil magic. So uh, that's really, really where it started out in terms of public presence. Oh, really, really. Uh, but you also, we just have mentioned that in one phrase, you also wrote um, uh, fictional novels at some point, or maybe you still do, but was that that experience and under still another pseudonym that you used then, uh, was that a very, at a very early stage or did you do that later? Well, I had been into poetry and fiction earlier on, but that was not occult or esoteric related. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did the, 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 the uh, novels you are mentioning, you're probably referring to, I wrote under my pen name, Victor Zobeck. Exactly. Uh, those were, that's were, well, yeah. Okay. To, again, cutting a long story short, they were they eventually uh, were published uh, too uh, after some earlier versions uh, as a trilogy uh, in mm-hmm. a paperback. It's, these are actually basically magical fantasy stories and uh, exactly. ba- based on the tree of life. Though that is never mentioned there, but uh, they, they you know everything happens in a magical land called Chaim, which of course is 
life in yeah. Hebrew. Yeah. And uh, this is, uh, these are the adventures of two uh, sorcerer's apprentices who are always tasked with uh, each one in, with a journey to some uh, to some other you know sorcerer or godhead or whatever uh, but i wrote those a lot later that was uh, okay. uh, i think mm-hmm. in the uh, early 90s as as i recall all oh, right right yeah. right okay okay so back to the to back to the 70s then right so you opened that bookshop in in bonn sigilmatic was your your thing at the time so what what happened then well for in bonn uh, in 79, well, we set up this esoteric bookshop and then hoping for clients, uh, which would, turned out to be quite a vain hope initially. Uh, you know, it took us about four and a half years to actually, uh, you know, turn a profit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was uh, a time where we had a lot of time on our hands. And uh, uh, right, I think it was in the end of 79, in December 79, when we, uh, when I met with a few people there, about a dozen people, very mixed, we were almost equally, you know, Know, males and female members uh, to set up what we termed the um, uh, uh, workshop or Arbeitskreis in German for experimental mm-hmm. magic. Mm-hmm. And now those were people hailing from very, very different backgrounds. I mean, uh, there were university students amongst them, but there were also people, you know, from the health profession. Uh, there were people who were very experienced in magic, some Bardonians among them, right. uh, others who were absolute tyros, others who were sort of, you know, just starting out as myself, for example, or my mm-hmm. that time girlfriend. And uh, we only had one... Uh, basic tenet that was that we would be uh, willing to go for an undogmatic approach to everything, you know, not just believing because some some venerable authority claimed this is so, this is that, this is the, the right. other, or the don't do this because it's too dangerous or whatever. Uh, <laughs> We, all we wanted to see was, uh, did things work? And if so, how and why? And uh, if not, why not? And so on. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we, we met for almost three years regularly. And uh, and this was all based for, you know, on practical work. It was very, very precious little uh, theory we discussed. Uh, what we really did was, you know, conduct rituals, uh, open air or indoors or in, in some caves and this, that and the other. Uh, and, and there was actually no taboo, you know, like uh, right. uh, somebody would, would do something about runes and, uh, and, and, you know, we'd spend a weekend and, in the forest doing rune magic at other times it was more the golden dawn tradition which informed a lot of us uh, at the time uh, planetary magic uh, elemental magic this that and the other talismans amulets we invited to guest speak some guest speakers occasionally for instance there was a uh, an African uh, medicine man. I mean, that's what he he called himself a fetish priest. He was actually from from Nigeria, living in Germany at the time, and uh, okay. he conducted one of our meetings and uh, and this, that, and the other. And mm-hmm. uh, there was pl- there were plenty of you know actually uh, hands on kind of success magic uh, operations we conducted, mm-hmm. and of course uh, we had a lot of discussions afterwards. I mean, not initially, like uh, we were discuss the results and and, uh, how it went and how it did go and then this, that and the other and we had some, well we had a hell of a lot of fun for one thing (laughs) for one thing (laughs) Uh, it was really, really very, very, very great uh, great fun and uh, and everyone, even those who were more experienced old hands, learned a lot from that experience and uh, so did yours truly I mean that's uh, really what uh, what uh, you might say anchored my uh, my my going for magic uh, f- full power. But I had I had a question about that exactly because you called it an anchor. That's is a much better word. I would have called it a foundation now, but the anchor is probably the better word. And um, what did anchor you? I mean, it sounds like maybe maybe it's just because you omitted something. And um, it sounds like you you picked things up from here and from there and sigil magic and uh, and the fetish priest etc cetera, etc cetera. and that kind of built your experience of course but was there some underlying um well foundation anchor that would that would be something where you could build all the rest on it or did it from the beginning was it from the beginning a very colorful very mixed thing that continued on like that 
Well, it was very mixed and colourful. Colourful is the right word uh, in that, you know, this being, uh, I mean, the majority of, of our operation took place in the early 80s, but but uh, there was still the aftermath, you know, of the hippie movement. There was the aftermath yeah. of the anti-authoritarian 70s uh, student revolt and uh, and movement. So uh, this was well, there was one thing that was absolutely clear. There was absolutely no hierarchy. There was no leader. There was no, uh, you know, kind of no CEO kind of structure or anything everything was done absolutely democratically and uh, no degree structure either and did it, no it was in that uh, I was coming to that yes it was absolutely no no magical order or organization of any time I mean obviously we had our, we, we, we had our members but but you know there was no formal membership there were no membership lists being kept it wasn't right. open to others uh, with exceptions like this guest uh, uh, workshop leader uh, I mentioned, for example, but uh, because we wanted to stay as a, as a group. But on the other hand, as a group, we weren't very very chummy amongst each other. Some were very, very close friends and still are to this very day. Uh, some, you know, just met on these occasions and uh, never never after or outside of these uh, meetings. Uh, some were lovers. There was a couple there, a married couple. Uh, actually, two uh, later on, three. I mean, two of other members married later on okay. uh, but uh, it was more a clique you might say than than anything else and it was certainly wasn't an order but what anchored us was well for one thing the experience you know that for every one of us uh, hey that we weren't alone in our craziness yeah yeah. Because I mean, let's yeah. let's face it. We we live in a in a we still do uh, in a, in a world in an environment which is actually not very conducive to uh, to going for magic and testing it out and taking it seriously in any way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Out, outside the occult scene, but that, at that time there actually wasn't any organized occult scene. That actually in in, in the German speaking countries there were lots of yeah. occultists around. Well, not yeah. that many, but uh, but uh, but quite a few. Uh, but uh, but it wasn't organized and most of us were actually looking across the channel towards England because a lot, a lot uh, at that time was was happening in the UK uh, which uh, you know for example more pragmatic kind of authors you know who weren't weren't all you know uh, fire and brimstone uh, type of uh, you know uh, old age uh, dogmatists like Eliphas Levy was or Papus or, <laughs> or, uh, or many of the German uh, old occultists really yeah. uh, so there was a, a fresh spirit of, you know, um, serious pragmatism with a lot of humor thrown in. And um, and that's that's what really anchored us, uh, not as a group together, as a group, you know, we as, as a unified body so much, as uh, the realization that we were actually onto something pretty serious and uh, something that actually worked a lot of the time, not always, but, but you know, seeing that you know, uh, science, I mean, like uh, academic science, like na the natural sciences and so on, wouldn't even allow for it to happen even once. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. There was something quite uh, quite extraordinary. And, uh, and yes, it enhanced life. It uh, made life more interesting, more colorful, more splendid, uh, more horrific sometimes as well. I mean, uh, it's no fun being chased by demons across the 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 the, the, sits the city all day. I mean, uh, sure. uh, or you know, or never being quite sure. Are you into a psychic crisis now? You know, are you are you going mad, stark mad, or yeah. Yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Just just uh, today, I received a, uh, an email from an old English friend of mine who who'd been into magic for something like yeah, forty five years or something, and he just dropped it now because he said uh, he felt he was losing his humanity because of it, and uh, uh, and and he wouldn't. He didn't want to end as a stark raving madman, and uh, well, I respect his decision, obviously. Uh, but uh, but I mean that there is that element to it. It may drive you across the edge, and uh, uh, yeah, more than once it actually has driven me across the edge, and quite a few other people I know, yeah. uh, like one of uh, our group uh, who uh, is actually to this very day has uh, ter awful problems with uh, Kundalini. Um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, phenomena and uh, and very, very little he can do about it. And uh, right. uh, this is the kind of 
So, yeah, well, you they, take you take it in your stride, maybe. Or, you know, I'm, I'm not so much you know for old war stories how we were in the trenches at the time, and I look at my <laughs> scar here and <laughs> and this that, and the other, or my medals for that matter. But mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's a path that can be risky and actually is risky if you take it seriously. Uh, like many other paths that are risky, of but uh, like uh, you, 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 you know, absolutely. I mean, you go into go, go into a series, you know, professional sports. Same story. It's so quite quite risky, and uh, there's a reason why most you know uh, sports people uh, will stop at around thirty, thirty five or something because they're wasted. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, may I interject two questions absolutely. here? Absolutely. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. Um, how how what would you suggest to somebody who who feels that danger to get to getting across the edge as you call it how, how do you prevent that how do you personally prevent that or how how would you go for preventing that well one thing we really learned all of us i think uh, at the time was that uh, grounding is actually extremely important but what does that actually mean and i don't just mean you know ritual yeah. grounding that that is a, a, a task to itself and i take it seriously and uh, there's lots of recommendations for that but one thing that's that's quite quite uh, important uh, at least that's the way i see it is uh, that you're actually grounded in real life you're like having a job uh, mm-hmm. maybe maybe having to, to take care of a family uh Uh, doing doing stuff which is probably possibly not related to any esoteric you know uh, or metaphysical theories or whatever for a while at least being able to switch it off so that's not something that would be in the way of your magical development but on the contrary would prevent you from going over the edge I th- actually, it, it won't just prevent you from going bonkers uh, mm. it will it will actually actually help in your uh, in your magical development to a large extent like take Alistair Crowley for instance I don't really take him too seriously as a magician mm-hmm. uh, as a metaphysician yeah and he's written some of the most lucid lines about mysticism I've ever read anywhere and I've really studied mysticism quite a lot right. uh, but um But one thing which people always loved about him, I mean, I know he was the most wickedest man in the world. Uh, at least that's what the, uh, you know, the yellow press would uh, make him out as. Yeah. And uh, and a lot of people hated him and for a reason and this, that and the other. But one thing, you know, one reason why he still, well, maybe not as widely read as he used to be, but, but still always worth a read is his down-to-earth, realistic, Uh, well, cynicism sometimes, but a sense of humor uh, at other times. Uh, he has this knack of, you know, boiling things down to their essence. Right, right. And, and, and their essence, I don't, I don't just mean his, his, his uh, highfalutin, uh, uh, cabalistic uh, speculations no, 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 and all that. Like, But you know, he, he like like you say, I'm a hell of a holy guru. I mean, <laughs> a sentence like that. I mean, there's yeah. self irony in that, yeah. even though he, even though he absolutely meant it. I mean, uh, <laughs> like any, like any narcissist really does, and he, I think he was a prime narcissist. But, um, but on but on the other hand, putting it that way, I mean, could you could you fancy Eliphas Levy saying uh, word, wording it like that, and not just no. because that was a hundred years before Crowley or fifty years? Not only because he was French, <laughs> and, and, and because he was French, and, and uh, you know, uh, Mathers wouldn't have said that, and neither, for that matter, would William, uh, William Butler Yeats. I mean, uh, who, who, whom I absolutely love as a poet to this very day, uh-huh. but uh, but uh, but uh, usually uh, Crowley was, uh, he, and that's the thing I possibly liked the most about him, and still do to some extent. Uh, he was unstuffy about things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's absolutely. what we that's what we liked about those contemporary British magical authors that mm-hmm. the, the lot of them not all maybe yeah. but most of them were very unstuffy and very relaxed about some matters and that was far more spoke far more to the times than any of the old age you know twenties uh, twenties uh, mm-hmm. old men's occultism uh, kind of uh, literature we had in German for instance absolutely but that's exactly. A- perfect link to my second interjected question I had. Um, you described the situation in Germany then as opposed to the one in Britain or in the English-speaking world. Uh, and 
what's the difference today? I get the impression today the situation has not not really changed a lot. I mean, there are some people around in the German-speaking world, like you and a few others, but um, in general, the main focus of something that has at some point started in Europe, in the in Central Europe, basically, has dramatically shifted first to the uh, British Isles and then even to the United States at some point. Would you agree on that? Or absolutely. I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, to all practical purposes, the uh, German magical scene, if there ever was one, and maybe we'll come to that when we discuss the unicorn and what it actually affected. And basically, uh, with our bottom workshop for experimental magic uh, uh, effected in, via these uh, channels. Uh, but basically, the magical scene in the German-speaking countries is more or less dead. I mean, there's a scene. Right. There's right. people around, yes. There's some very Even good today. people. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I'm speaking of the contemporary scene. There's, uh, there's uh, people around. Uh, as always, you have a lot of Tossers who you know are just uh, self-important and uh, uh, not well educated, but full of themselves. Mm. Uh, you have that a lot, but you, okay, you find that all over the place, all over the world. You'll find that yeah. in African magic just as well as you find in the UK or America, <laughs> or in uh, in Latin America, uh, and in Germany. You know, the German-speaking countries includes Austria and uh, Switzerland and parts of Belgium uh, and Luxembourg. Uh, yes, you will find that as well. But you'll have a few select people who are really into it uh, who've done their homework who are you might say uh, deeply involved and and who are original thinkers yes but as a whole on the whole i'd say yes uh, we are back at that situation with has possibly shifted more towards the United States than the UK at the moment yeah i would think so yes yeah. yes but do you have an explanation for that I mean, not for the U.S., but why Why Central Europe? Let's call it Central Europe, right? Um, why has that become so void in some, in, to some extent? I don't think, I don't know. I'm not sure it's an explanation I have. I have a hunch or two. But, so if I may voice that, uh, uh, no guarantees that I'm absolutely correct. But uh, it may have to do to some extent, where, A, with a pragmatic spirit, which is still very much more evolved and stronger uh, in the Anglo-Saxon cultures, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm including Canada and Australia as well, and New sure. Zealand and uh, and and parts of English-speaking uh, India, even. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is one point, uh, and the other, I mean, pragmatic meaning that uh, you know people are not so put off if you actually you know go for say success magic, right. Which right. of all of Sigil magic is about success magic. There's absolutely nothing really metaphysical about it. Forget the Zoskia cultus, which was basically an invention by Kenneth Grant and and uh, um, uh, Austin Spare actually played him along because he was more or less in love with Steffi Grant. But that's another story. Uh, but uh, but uh, so so it's more about you know hands on kind of utilitar utilitarian stuff. So that may be one right. one major reason. And um, for another reason, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure about that, but uh, perhaps uh, it's this kind of, you know, splendid isolation the Anglo-Saxon, well, English-speaking world is enjoying and has always enjoyed, well, mm -hmm. ever since Britain became an empire, uh, and still is, I mean, now with, you know, every man and his dog speaking English and having yeah, to sure. speak English, I mean, because, you know, you, in, most, in most jobs, uh, you can't, you, you won't have any career at all if you don't at least have a fair command of English, if you, so, as rudimentary as it may be. So, yeah. so they tend to isolate themselves a bit, and uh, that is a good and a bad thing at uh, in the same time. The, the bad thing is, of course, that uh, you know it kind kind of becomes uh, more or less um, reiterative. You know, uh, uh, feedback loops, close yeah. feedback loops. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the good thing is that it becomes more intense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, that's why I do this podcast here from Europe. And still we have about 85% of our audience over in North America. Right? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Uh, I think at the, uh, you know, back in the 70s, North America was, I mean, there's, there's, there's actually quite a strong American occult tradition. 
but uh, it hasn't been, you know, it's not so well known outside of the, or wasn't so well known outside of the United States uh, at the time. I mean, mm-hmm. it started off uh, even early on with uh, Joseph Smith and Mormonism. I mean, Smith yeah, was, sure. Smith was uh, you might say, a quack maybe, but uh, but he was also a channeler and, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a psychic medium and, and, and this, that, and the other. And he wasn't the first, he wasn't the only one, he wasn't the last. Or take Pascal uh, Beverly Hare Randolph and his uh, sex magic and uh, right. uh, right. Uh, or, or, or even uh, even you know uh, people like Spence who you know set up the a- Amok uh, Rosicrucian movements, this that and the other Gerald Manley Hall and 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 this that and the other, uh, there was quite a strong tradition of it, uh, but uh, but it uh, didn't you know uh, project itself so much into the rest even of the English speaking world. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas uh, the English influence via the Golden Dawn, obviously, especially with the Golden Dawn. But hey, who made the Golden Dawn really famous in the 20th century? An American, Israel Rigardi. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, okay, so he he used to be a, a, a secretary, was which was basically an unpaid kick, uh, <laughs> side side kick or kick ass <laughs> for for Alistair Crowley for a yeah. while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but hey, he was a very serious practitioner in his own right, and a Jungian uh, analyst, and this that and the other. One of the most intelligent people in that scene, anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah, and and I think America has basically uh, caught up. That's what happened, and and uh, I think the UK. Authors in the 70s and 80s uh, uh, helped kick that off to a large extent, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but again, there there had actually been a fair fairly developed basis for that. I mean, look at Gnostica magazine, which was came out in which oh, yeah. uh, Karl Weschke uh, used to do, and then uh, you know uh, which had, which was American, and then there was uh, a hell of a lot going on, of course, in the psychedelic scene. Then and then you had uh, people who were not maybe the occultist like Timothy Leary, but they, Leary. but yeah, 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 Leary McKenna exactly. They impacted the occult scene to a large yeah. extent, and uh, basically they still do.
Derek Fichter's version of ancient Egyptian music. This piece was called Pharaoh Ramses II, a very great personality in the Egyptian history indeed, and Egypt and magic, that goes well together, I thought, so I hope you liked my choice. Right, um, well, I won't keep you for much longer. I think we are going right back to continue to walk through Frater Yudi's life to talk about his further experiences and all that he has to present to us. We go into part two of the three-part interview today. Um, and once again, immediately after, we are going to hear Another piece of music, but this time I'll come back to you before. So listen again to my talk with Frater U.D. Let's go back now to the 1980s and Bonn. So we were just talking about that unicorn. You also was, there was a key word there about your magazine there and also workshops, I think, that were started there. At well, the uh, Jörg, Jörg Wichmann, uh, who was part of the uh, the Bonn workshop for uh, experimental magic, mm -hmm. uh, he later on uh, decided to set up this magazine Unicorn, a uh, German language magazine. Uh, and a lot of us participated, you know, be it as authors or initially, you know, cutting up texts and gluing them to paper. <laughs> and then, I mean, this this was pre uh, pre PC and, and and desktop publishing, um, which came came on later, but uh, but okay. And uh, you know, and write of course writing stuff and discussing it with readers and this that, and the other. And that's how, at least for a short time, something like a German-speaking magical scene began began to develop mm -hmm. around this magazine, and there were other the magazines run by other people later on as well, and um, and uh, from this developed a strong interest. I mean, I could act when I was still running in my bookshop, I could actually see it, you know, uh, uh, when we set up our mail order business, and uh, you know, when I when either I or someone else would would uh, you know review a book in Unicorn. Bam! Suddenly, you know, the orders came in. People would order this right. book from us, and uh, so we could actually see that it did have an impact. Mm -hmm. And um, later on, uh, my uh, my wife and I and some other people, we where we uh, well, I'd actually set up. But that's another story. I actually set up my publishing uh, company when Liber, when I got hold of a. English copy of Live and Null by Peter Carroll, All right. and and I and he and I well I tried to get the rights for German and I wrote but uh, never received a response. Later on, I found out that he was traveling the world at the time for about a year, so uh, obviously there was no possible no possibility for him to to respond. So I said, well, by, to myself, well. Chuck it, this book is so important, I want to have it out in German anyway. So I'm, you know, basically it was a copyright violation initially, but I could, okay, I put in a notice that the holders of copyright were cordially invited to contact me, uh, you know, because of uh, license fees and this, that, and the other, which eventually happened uh, later on. But anyway, yeah. I, so I had so I had this, uh, this thing, and, I, and I, you know, I was quite an inexperienced as a publisher, I mean, I'd written for, for lots of mags and, and stuff uh, and so on, but I'd never been a book publisher myself. And so I thought, well, you know, the scene being very small, what we do is, you know, we do a little limited edition of this, a limited uh, number of copies, only 150, as I recall. Uh, we, we do the subscription base and, uh, hey, yeah, it will be a prepayment only. So uh, people will have to subscribe and they'll have to pay for the subscribed copy. Right. And what and and obviously people who haven't subscribed will buy it later. They will pay a slightly higher price. Mm -hmm. And what can, what can I say? I mean, it, it was sold out in I think some like two months or three months. <laughs> I was I was flabbergasted. And and the and the and apart apart from that, I was happy. Not not so much for the commercial aspect because I mean, never made a lot of money with that with that publishing house. But sure. what it did indicate is that, that that there was beginning there was a scene growing, evolving that was actually interested in that kind of literature, which mm -hmm. no major publishing company, even the esoteric ones, there were quite a few around at the time, uh, would even touch. Right. And, uh, you know, it's what, what's called a niche market. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that you probably helped growing it also, not by your work with the Bond Group, but then also by publishing the book itself, right? Uh, yeah, I certainly did. And, uh, well, what happened then was 
that uh, uh, a guy who later on took over a unicorn magazine for a few few issues. Uh, uh, and I, we, well, we, we talked, and my, and my wife, uh, too, uh, who had uh, written the book on uh, elemental magic. And so we tried, uh, you know, we, basically it was the same thing. We said, okay, let's try if we can do a, that was a commercial seminar, a, a workshop, four days uh, at his place and near the Extensteine in in, uh, in uh, Germany, in the middle of Germany, which is one of the old uh, cult places. Uh, and, uh, and so... Uh, well, we caught, we we had a bit of a mailing list at the time that, by then, and uh, so we contacted people and we put up some ads and so on. And hey, our first seminar was uh, seventeen people signing up in in no time, and uh, and it was a it was a ripping success. And that's still all pre-internet, of course. And that was all pre-internet. Yeah, yeah. Imagine people who actually would actually read papers at the time. <laughs> people could actually read at the time. <laughs> they, they didn't need podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for coming. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you're you're unfortunately you're absolutely right. Uh, and and so the, the whole but chaos magic and you. How would you define that relation? I mean, is that something? Something that you adopted, or something that you transformed, or uh, how would you how would you uh, situate yourself within? Chaos well, biographically Magic? speaking, uh, I had moved to uh, removed to to Berlin at the time, which was basically because I was trying to get out of my uh, bloody uh, military service mm -hmm. uh, because they were, you know, I mean, I wasn't in active service anymore. I, ser I served two years in the German army, and became a lieutenant of the of the reserve. But as a reservist, uh, they they developed that habit of uh, calling me up every other year and uh, after the sixth time you know I was just uh, okay I was uh, lieutenant first class by then ha, by then haha ha. but uh, you know I was just simply fed up and uh, West Berlin at that time was uh, uh, was excluded from that because it was under yeah. al uh, Western Allied uh, control and uh, so the German army had no, <laughs> had no say in that matter right. yeah. and so I removed uh, to West Berlin I only lived there for 11 months and 9 days which is an indicator of how much I loved it but <laughs> but anyway at that time uh, I suddenly received a rather rather um, a peevish letter from a Mr. Peter James Carroll uh, from England uh, who oh. had just discovered that actually his li beloved Leibniz had been published without his license in German and uh, so uh, long story short again uh, we obviously re responded immediately and then I invited him over to Berlin and he actually came visited me for a weekend and uh, at that time yeah we, we actually hit it off quite well and uh, we did, actually did a long seven hour interview interview uh, which we later on I, well, I, pub I published uh, in, in my uh, uh, publishing firm Edition Margus as it was called and uh, then we uh, I was fairly well established in the seminar scene by that time so I suggested that he and I uh, do a seminar on chaos magic in Germany mm -hmm. which we did and uh, by then he had uh, Basically, come up with Liber Pactionis, which was basically the the charter, as it were, of what was then right. to become the magical pact of the Illuminates of Thanateros, which we then formally founded in an extinct volcano crater in the Rhineland, uh, not far actually from where the Bonn uh, Workshop of Experimental Magic uh, used to work okay. and uh, that was uh, that was the IOT proper I mean there had been an IOT which was more or less just a virtual uh, kind of thing not really a formal uh, organization uh, it was was more or less on paper and in the minds of the the English people the English you know magicians who were more or less part of it but the Liber Pactionis or the magical pact of the Illuminates of Tenatros IOT that actually formalized it you know with a rudimentary degree structure and this that and the other and so I was basically a co-founder of the IOT Absolutely. and uh, that was why because I really loved chaos magic 
and uh, yeah. to, to some extent I still do, even though I've taken different a different path uh, now for the past thirty years or so. But but uh, but uh, why why did I love it? What do I like about Chaos Magic? That might be a question you might care to interject at some time. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> okay, good point. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one thing, uh, what I always liked about uh, Chaos Magic was its um, iconoclastic approach. Not f for mm -hmm. itself, but I mean, you can be iconoclastic and still be uh, fucked with. But yeah. uh, <laughs> pardon my French. You can, yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, because uh, what Chaos Magic uh, try to do, and I'll come back to Pragmatic Magic a little bit later on, because basically, what I saw it, I saw it as a kind of, kind of escalation of, of Pragmatic Magic in a way. But pra Chaos Pragmatic Magic was in your biography before Chaos that, Magic. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'll come back to that if I may a oh, yeah. little bit later, since sure. we're at Chaos Magic right now. Yeah. Uh, well don't interrupt interrupt that uh, flow sure, uh, sure. Um, if you're okay with that uh, sure. fine uh, what I thought was it was an escalation of my initial approach that don't take anything at face value and the only rule the only guide the only law as it were that I would uh, have for pragmatic magic is it has to work everything mm. else is secondary yeah. or tertiary even uh, it has to work else mm. Uh, there's no no point about blabbing about the ethics of, of magic or whatever or morals uh, if it doesn't work in the first place. Yes. So uh, if it works, then then we then we'll actually have a problem. And I uh, <laughs> and I, I still st I still abide by that. Uh, the uh, and one one chapter in my new book, uh, written by uh, Josef Knecht, is uh, actually has this quote from me that uh, the problem with magic is not that if it works, but that it does. Yeah. And what chaos magic does is reduce magic to its uh, hopefully reduce to its hopefully naked skeleton of uh, effective techniques mm -hmm. uh, and it uses a novel kind of aesthetics which is quite important actually it's been much underrated i think uh, when chaos magic is discussed in academia for instance these days which it mm -hmm. seriously is uh, it, it has uh, it has an its own terminology for example just speaking of gnosis when you actually mean trance Yes, yes, very true. Yes, uh, very true. Yeah. Which, which is correct, the correct way of doing it. I mean, uh, this, this is a form of noses, absolutely, but uh, but nobody did that before. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, it has uh, this element of, uh, this aleatoric element, basically, I mean, what does chaos magic really derive from? I mean, even though uh, Pete Carroll at that time, he didn't know squat about existentialist philosophy for instance mm -hmm. or, or structuralism for that matter or let alone deconstructionist uh, <laughs> philosophy but uh, but what, in Bible Null uh, there was a lot of these elements in there it was iconoclastic in the sense that uh, you know old uh, especially the stuffy kind of uh, kind of traditional uh, uh, tenets were, were being questioned and questioned and uh, uh, or invalidated even, and mm -hmm. it was, had a very novel, creative approach, and you know, like saying, "Well, okay, well, maybe there are no, no, you know, no, no uh, subtle entities like spirits or ghosts or elves or whatever you want to call them, uh, but uh, hey, why not create them?" You know, and yeah. uh, it had this yeah. aleatoric element of Luke Reinhardt's, uh, Luke Reinhardt's, uh, the Dice Man. Okay. To it, yeah. yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. you know, there's this chaos magical technique of uh, throwing a die and uh, deciding um, what to believe for the next three days or next year or maybe the next life or whatever. Or yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that's that's actually derived from the dice man. Oh, great! Really, really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And. Uh, um, and uh, of course, the chaos fear itself is from Michael Moorcock, and and this that, and the other. So it, it has this element. It has this element of punk culture to it. 
Yeah, sure, definitely, yes. And uh, I rather like that because, again, because of its uh, unstuffiness and because it was anti-establishment, and uh, because uh, it wasn't just novel for novel novelty's sake. It was novel in the sense of that it was uh, it introduced a new creative element into magic, which, in my view, traditional magic had been sadly, sadly lacking for not just years but centuries. Yeah, and didn't it also bridge a little bit that that the gap between what some people call high or low magic, or did it bridge that gap also to some extent? Yes, it did. Indeed, that is uh, one of the things where I say it escalated pragmatic magic to a sense because pragmatic does ex exactly the same thing. I, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've just uh, you know insinuated it, saying that you know you can talk about magic ethics as much as you like, but uh, yeah. what if magic doesn't work in the first place? What's the point? <laughs> And uh, in chaos, chaos magic uh, uh, leaves you know leaves alone that question of ethics and uh, the, yeah. and that that by itself I think is is quite crucial for an effective um, um, kind of magic which is more you might say technical than metaphysical. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I mean, for example, take take Crowley's definition of black magic. He says that any act that is not intended or striving towards Uh, reunifying you with Godhead is an act of black magic. Well, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, Al. That, that's not a definition of magic. That's a definition of mysticism. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, definitely. And it's funny to hear it from his voice, right? That, that yeah, absolutely, that, isn't it? Yeah, uh, old crow, yeah. no less. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, no, <laughs> well, uh, now I have to bring you back to pragmatic magic because I don't want. Yeah, okay. In leave that out but uh, I interjected a question that you interjected so I, <laughs> we had, we had, we had uh, to, uh, boy aren't we meta today <laughs> uh, we are incredible <laughs> incredible um, no but pragmatic magic when 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 and how did that start what what, what initiated it was that actually then? my second article in uh, in uh, in uh, unicorn magazine unicorn at that time was a quarterly so mm -hmm. uh, came out every three months And uh, in my second article, I think uh, I uh, I wrote on a concept towards a concept of pragmatic magic, and what I did there was uh, actually analyze traditional magic. Uh, it takes some th stuff, you know, like correspondences. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you have correspondences. You know, like some author, some classical author, telling you, well, uh, Jupiter is assigned to you know the the the, the number four, and um, Zinc as an as a, as a, as a metal and and you know uh, this plant and that color and this you know uh, yeah, 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 yeah. right so mm -hmm. fine uh, we know where this comes from but uh, but never mind but if you if you have, you know if you have a look, take a look at six or seven different authors classical <laughs> authors who are claiming to be classical authors suddenly suddenly you're hit with with a hell of a lot of inconsistencies definitely. <laughs> you know, yeah. Actually, Crowley was was quite a genius, and you know when he when he wrote or rather completed Libel Seven Seven Seven, which Alan Bennett had started, uh, he just took over the manuscript and and uh, and uh, completed it. Right. Uh, when, when, for example, when he when he says uh, uh, something like to the effect, I'm not quoting literally here, but uh, Jupiter, uh, this, that, and that, for instances, plus all kind of you know glo was glorious. Uh, smelts or whatever. I thought, hey, wait, that's 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 bloody bloody vague. What does that mean? But actually, 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 and I've come to the realization that, that this is actually what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, take, or, or take Saturn. So you want something? Well, I would say, okay, take take sinister or heavy smelts or uh, yeah. you know uh, parts for instance yeah. Uh, yeah. why because that's what saturn is about and it's not the question of do you use that plant and that herb yeah. or that uh, and what if you can't find it and uh, and and uh, does yeah. it ha does it have to be you know half a grain or or three ounces or this you know uh, yeah. and wh wh what i did was analyze uh, classical traditional magic in terms of its inconsistencies mm -hmm. And then I said, you know, and, and there's there's some some, and 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 of of course also it's Eurocentricity, 
Because I said, yeah. you know, if we if we look if we look say at the Caribbean or uh, or the West Africa, then we take some some be it, be it voodoo or uh, juju or uh, obia uh, practitioners yeah. or whatever they, and there's lots of them about. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, when they do a love spell, they won't use the planet Venus. They will not use copper and the colors green <laughs> and and the, and the number seven. Sure. And, sure. And, because, and, yeah. and assuming, just assuming, that's maybe a bit a big assumption, but assuming that their love spells are just as efficient, as efficacious as are ours, then how can this be? Because if you say, you know, there's something like, well, it's it's only about, you know, it must be Venus if it's love and it has to be the planet Venus and it has to be, because that's what traditionalists always say. Uh, if you don't use that, it will go wrong. It yeah. will not happen. It won't work, and so on. Well, bah! Here you have this Obia man saying, yeah. "Man, I'm not, we, we're not using Venus." <laughs> Who that? You know, and, uh, and, which raises the question: uh, Are we so, um, so maybe so, 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 so uh, Im- impacted by our tradition? Are we about, about our background that we? get stuck in in those in those um, correspondences or whatever you would like to call well them. if you if you look at the golden dawn which of course is uh, late 19th century and mm-hmm. onwards yeah uh, you'll see there's a lot of western tradition in that but of course it's filtered via the the, the well the, the filter uh, the, the filter of theosophy now theosophy was of course a very eclectic Kind mm-hmm. of thing started off with you know ancient Egypt, Isis unveiled, and all that, and yeah. uh, then it went on to Adia philo- uh, theosophy, and uh, and uh, included a lot of Eastern practices yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you basically had this uh, this dichotomy of Eastern and Western esotericism. Mm-hmm. which academia today actually still uh, abides by to some extent. Yeah. Um, uh, there's lots of good reasons for that, but but never mind. Uh, the, the point I'm making is that uh, even the Golden Dawn was very, very, very much impacted by Western humanities. Sure. And that means the Greek and the, the Roman or Latin, and of course then later on the, the Christian uh, cultural impact. And... Uh, even if you take the pagan Greek impact and uh, rate it higher than the later Christian impact, you'll still mm-hmm. be stuck with Greek culture and, 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 and you know, Greek philosophy and, and, and Greek godheads and, and yeah. uh, Greek uh, correspondences and, and, and this, that and the other. And, mm-hmm. um, and of course, that's why I say Eurocentricity. When the gold Definitely. lord started out, I mean, that was, a, that was the heyday of, of British colonialism. European yeah. colonialism, for that matter, actually. I mean, uh, Germany, of course, was a boy who came late to the table, and then uh, they they started off with, and so did Belgium. Uh, well, Belgium hadn't existed before 1830, but okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, France and Spain had been at it, and Portugal, and even the Dutch uh, for a while, and and this, that, and the other, and. Uh, so, uh, so there was this thing about uh, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, Kipling's uh, white man's burden and and uh, the, the the superior supposed superiority of European Western, yeah. uh, basically Greco-Roman and modern uh, European culture. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. so it didn't really fit or dovetail nicely into colonial ideology to state that, you know, those, you know, colored people in the Caribbean, you know, in the colonies, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, yeah. uh, uh, or, or even in India for that matter, <laughs> you know, that they might be up to something, or that they might be onto something, and that they actually might be quite rational and, and quite, uh, right. quite uh, efficient in what they are doing, even though it was not Christianity, even though it was not Greek or Roman paganism, even though it was not classical education involved, or even literal, yeah. literate yeah. education yeah. for that matter. Yeah. And uh, so uh, even though, I mean, okay, I know that voodoo has uh, quite, a, quite a few, uh, Haitian voodoo, for instance, has quite a few influences from medieval French grimoires and stuff like that, but that's because it's an eclectic cult. <laughs> and uh, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's quite normal, actually. You expect that. Plus, anthropology wasn't as well developed at the time. It was just, you know, it's... Uh, 
Of course, but did, did in your opinion, did what Alistair did in India and uh, and and brought over here, did that have a an opening impact on the Western necessary tradition, or was it also a bit the colonializing effect that? Uh, it went both ways, really. I mean, uh, Madame Blavatsky, uh, and she's still basically a kind of a national saint in India to this very day. Why? Because what she did was basically reintroduce a lot of Vedic stuff into India, which the Indians had more or less forfeited, at least the educated classes, because they were, you know, trying to curry, if you pardon my the pun, the curry favor with the colonial British overlords. Yeah, and, sure. and with with Western rationalism, it wasn't just about colonialism. Uh, it was about Western rationalism. It was, you know, the 19th century. I mean, hey, there was the heyday of uh, technocracy and um, and uh, positivism and, uh, you know, Darwinism came, uh, came on and uh, the Industrial Revolution was in full uh, mount and this, that and the other. So, so uh, I mean, I, I grew up in former colonies and uh, – and, uh, more or less shortly after their independence. And uh, I could still see that and sense that spirit very much alive there among the elites, the educated classes, yeah. the people who are actually running the, the countries, you know, the country, the, you know, the politicians and, and, and commerce and this and the other. And so what Madame Blavatsky actually did was reintroduce a lot of these Indian intellectuals to their own tradition, albeit filtered via their, her own her theosophical um, viewpoints. So, uh, yeah. but 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 in general, to get to the first part of your question, yes, of course, a lot of Eastern uh, influence uh, uh, around, and uh, I mean, it impacted what was later to become New Age and still does, uh, mm -hmm. or so or, you know, modern spirituality or whatever you want to call, call it, uh, stuff like yoga, <clears throat> which initially was a, was a martial art, really, but uh, most Indians even don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, which uh, it, it was, you know, softened up uh, by Indian nationalists in order to curry favor in the West for the Indian independence movement. That's why. Right. That's why you have wellness uh, uh, disciplined yoga in in the West all over the place, and nobody, nobody really, or hardly any people, are really aware of what a militant and actually. Uh, uh, militaristic kind of discipline it originally was in mm. India. One could go on and on with Fratri UD, I think. Um, what an amazingly interesting life in magic that he had. And it's not finished yet what we talk about today. So um, there will be many more things to learn and to hear from him. So stay with us because there is a third part this time to the interview. I would like to mention something now here. We are going to talk very briefly also about um, his Ice Magic book. Many of you have certainly heard about that book, but many of you in the English speaking world have probably always wanted to get an English translation of that great book Ice Magic and it has not existed so far so um, I am happy to tell you that Theon Publishing yes them again um, they are in at the moment preparing a version an English edition of Ice Magic by Frater UD and this is going to be I think an exciting moment um, when this will be finally published very much anticipated and I'm happy to let you know today that this book will exactly see soon the light and we'll keep you informed when it'll be really out. Okay, I promised you some music and some music you'll have. You remember a few episodes back, I played three pieces of music by Wilburn Burchett, Master Wilburn Burchett, actually, as he should be called. And... Um, well, he is an amazing musician. You remember he had written those very special pieces for guitar, which he, he has written a psychic meditation course and accompanied that with his um, mystical pieces for guitar. He released seven albums in the 1970s. And when I played 
this music last time um, I got many reactions that do play him again because he's wonderful yes he's wonderful and today now immediately after me finishing that chat you will hear Wilburn Burchette and his piece Building the Circle then we delve right away in the third part and last part of the interview with Fratri Udi and that will be followed Again, by a piece of music, the last piece of music for today. After the interview, that will be the Wolf Song, Warsong, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrongly because that's Swedish. I can't speak Swedish. It's actually the text from a lullaby from the famous book by Astrid Lindgren that many of you as a child might have read, Ronja, the robber's daughter. And Jonna Jinton, the young Swedish musician, she took the text from that book in Swedish language and made a beautifully meditative song called The Wolf Song. That's what's going to come at the end of the interview. But now, first, let's go to listen to Wilburn Burchett and his wonderful piece, Building the Circle. <laughs>
We should go back now to to other types of magic that you had founded, I think, because we have not yet spoken about uh, cyber magic. Uh, we have not yet spoken about ice magic. So, <laughs> um, what do we talk? What do we want to talk about there? <laughs> well, let's take cyber magic and uh, uh, okay. When I, when I say basically, just to to make sure there's no misunderstanding here, when I say I'm I'm the co-founder of Pragmatic Magic, that is right yeah. and wrong in. in I mean, I'm the co-founder in the sense that I actually coined the term. That is Mm -hmm. true. But uh, it wasn't that I invented it in any way or said, you know, Uh, uh, well... You invent or found pragmatic magic. I mean, this is almost a contradiction, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it's just that. Uh, well, a lot of people at the time, you know, uh, commented that uh, they weren't, weren't, hadn't been aware that there was some, such a thing as pragmatic magic. I said, yeah, you, of course you had, because I, I invented the term. <laughs> but uh, the, the thing itself, what I, what I described there, you know, being undogmatic, uh, being, being, uh, yeah. all, it all being all about does it work or not uh yeah. that of course uh, was uh, wasn't the my, my doing and not my, or at least not my doing alone absolutely not yeah. um well in chaos magic you had right from the start you had a, i mean most of that was was really uh, peter carroll's uh, hobby horse you know trying to tie it up to quantum quantum uh, mechanics or physics uh, in in one way or another. Uh, What I did like about it was the informational approach. Uh, And that is something which I still within the confines of chaos magic, when I'm still, you know, running the German speaking sections of the IoT and and, uh, we're having our yearly moots and uh, and this, that and the other. Uh, I invest. I investigated uh, that uh, element of uh, at that time still chaos magic, mainly the informational magic approach, uh, a bit stronger uh, and more in detail. And what I did there was try to uh, do some experiments with people, you know, like conveying knowledge of foreign languages, for instance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. you'd have one guy who'd like like. Uh, Yes, truly, you would be fairly versed, well versed in, in English, and uh, and and someone else who wasn't. And uh, uh, you know, I, I developed some operations how to transfer that to some extent, and and right. results were mixed. Let's put it this way: they weren't spectacular, but uh, but some were pretty pretty good. But like people saying, "Well, it's not you know that the other guy then suddenly has my command of English." But whenever he starts, you know, digging into English, into grammar, into semantics and uh, reading it and speaking it and so on, uh, he suddenly finds it a hell of a lot easier than he did before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically uh, what cyber magic is about is transferring information from one or basically you might say copying information from one uh, place uh, or state to another Mm-hmm. Uh, essentially, it's very similar. It's, it's actually not that modern or, or, or unusual as it may sound, because in, in traditional, especially Eastern traditional magic, you you might have the, you know the uh, uh, the phenomenon that, for example, a guru will be aware that he's going to leave the earth soon, you know, die in other words, <laughs> uh, croak, <laughs> and uh, he'll take his uh, his uh, designed uh, successor. Uh, to some place and they'll sit there meditating and Mm -hmm. uh, at least that's what tradition says and the the guru will transmit his uh, his or her uh, knowledge or wisdom really that's more about wisdom than about knowledge Uh, and maybe some of their powers uh, to the uh, design successor after Mm -hmm. which either immediately or short time after uh, Guru will uh, basically uh, kick the bucket, and uh, and that, I mean that's that's essentially uh, the rationale behind the Dalai Lama succession succession in, in yes. Tibet as well, for instance. Sure. And so basically, cyber magic addresses this as well, but uh, more on a, on a you might say information theory basis. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. Well, what what brings someone, well, you, <laughs> as it was, um, to to go through your life with redefining magic all the time, reinventing things all the time? And many people <laughs> who be around in that world, they define 
if it's if if they can define one thing or they follow one school and then they maybe refine it and make it deepen their knowledge or become better at it. But you you seem to move on and on and on. And it's always new and it's always something fresh and exciting. Uh, why? Well, the simple answer would be because I won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, all magical, conventional magic systems I'm aware of uh, have their limits. Sure. Uh It's it's one thing to fantasize about taking a voodoo doll and putting pins into it and uh, healing the other people <laughs> or uh, killing them off or whatever. Uh, and it's another thing of actually making it happen. And I'm not yeah. saying, uh, to be perfectly clear, I'm not saying it doesn't ever happen, mm -hmm. but it's nothing that uh, will happen too frequently and uh, and certainly not without certain restrictions or conditions bound to it and it's these conditions which interest me most and yeah. so when i when i find that for example uh, take take the classical approach to magic uh, where they tell you like take the golden dawn just because it's uh, something most of your listeners will probably be familiar with um Uh, they'll tell you, well, you know, set up a, uh, let's say, a mercury ritual while well, you would do it eight times and you'll color, the, put put up, you know, uh, either color the entire temple, you know, paint it in, in orange or use mm -hmm. orange drapes or whatever, uh, you know, and, and the number eight and, and uh, mm -hmm. this, that and the other. And, uh, you know, you do a hymn to mercury and blah at the mercury hour on the mercury day and, and this, that and the other when mercury is uh, not retrograde or whatever, your horoscope, your uh, natal chart or whatever. Uh, okay. And so you do this f to some effect because you want something to happen, which is related to mercury, obviously. Yeah. Uh, okay. Once that thing happens, great. Fine, it works, doesn't it? Mm. Great. What What if it doesn't? What if it doesn't happen? What if, it, what if the the outcome is zilch? Yeah. And that's something yeah. every practicing magician would have experienced, or maybe mm. even experiences, maybe even most of the time. Right. Now, for, forget the the fact that uh, you know modern physics will say, well, hey, this can't happen anyway. Modern psychology yeah. will say, well, you're only paranoid if you think you, you it, it's happening or it happened. It's because of that, you know, uh, blah blah blah. That's actually uh, a case for a mental uh, yeah. uh, therapy yeah. or something. No, no, yeah. no. Uh, okay, forget about that for a moment. Just to, you know, to stay in shop in, in the within the club of magicians we say well why didn't it now the classic answer is of course well there must be some mistake you made maybe mm -hmm. those, those eight orange candles weren't of the same orange hue right or they were not long enough or you should have shouldn't have lit them up from left to right but from right to left or whatever in other mm -hmm. words there, there, there will, you will always find excuses why it didn't work Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. sooner or later, uh, this gets a bit thin, in the yeah. tooth, and uh, and so sigil magic, uh, yeah, fantastic results. But hey, not always. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. if magic doesn't work always, you could say, okay, it's not the magic that doesn't work; it's the magician. But hey, that's you know that's like like communist or fascist ideology. Well, they'll <laughs> tell you the ideolo ideology is perfect. It's just the yeah. poor punters who aren't. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you are yeah. not class conscious enough, and that is why, because of your yeah. petit bourgeois inhibitions, yeah. Yeah. and that's why yeah. the revolution failed, or right. uh, or whatever. You're you're not of the you know you're not of the right Aryan race, or you're not pure yeah. enough, and yeah. and that is why yeah. it didn't work out. Shit like mm. that, to uh, yeah. put it mildly, uh, yeah. will always come along. But uh, that's what I say. I won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll investigate it seriously, but when I come to the conclusion that this is just, you know, basically uh, fumbling around, and most magicians I know are quite happy to, if, if they achieve a success rate of 51%, mm. they'll say, great. Yeah. And, and, but to me, not taking no for an answer sounds like the definition itself of, uh, of somebody practicing magic. Totally, because magic is really not about you know, adapting to life and the powers that be as we know them 
and as, mm. as they are imposed upon us. Mm. Uh, what came later on for me was, and that's still my focus to this very day, is uh, you might say extreme preoccupation with the phenomenon of human powerlessness. That is something mm. I find totally Absolutely, I don't use that term lightly, uh, mm. absolutely unacceptable. Mm, sure. And uh, what is magic if not going against exactly that, against yeah. the powerlessness of uh, humanity? Yeah, yeah. Or any li living being for that matter. But all right, yeah. I'm a, a, as a two-legged and more or less uh, human look-alike, I will stick with humans for the time being. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, magic, uh, in my view, and, and actually there's a lot of that in, within you know, traditional uh, shamanism, for instance, that the shaman is usually an outsider of their tribe. Mm -hmm. And he would not limit his actions towards two-legged uh, uh, human-looking uh, beings. That is true. Right? That is true. Yeah. But that's, that's, of course, because most shamans, he male or female will work with the spirit uh, model of magic yeah. but uh, yeah. but that's that's another st that's another story uh, another yeah. Yeah, prob probably yeah but yeah. Um, it's because uh, uh, they are outsiders why there's a this very very simple maybe simplistic explanation to that let's mm. say you're living in the countryside you have a farm and your neighbors have farms I mean they're far you're farmer and they're farmers and suddenly, you know, uh, you gain this reputation that you are able to cause rain when, when there's a drought. Mm -hmm. And so people come to you for help. And uh, you say, well, you do your best. You do your very best. And okay. And maybe occasionally you're successful. You know, you do whatever you do. And uh, suddenly it rains and, and uh, there's a harvest and everyone's happy and everyone's fed and, and people don't starve and stuff like that. Important stuff, really. I mean, mm -hmm. not starving is rather important for humans, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> to put it mildly. Okay. Now, <laughs> but one, once, then suddenly, I mean, Henderson Ranking by Saul Bellow is, is really about that topic as well, isn't it? One thing, you're not successful. Mm -hmm. The drought keeps on. Well, that's, that causes a lot of bad blood, doesn't it? Certainly. Now, yeah. what, what if, uh, what if suddenly it rains, but, you know, uh, there's, there's a flood? Mm. inundation you know mm. everything you know gets you know just washed away houses and people and cattle livestock and all mm -hmm. uh, now who do you think people will suspect of having caused that in the first place mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. the guy you know who is able to you know make rain happen he can probably also make the deluge happen or hailstorms or whatever yeah. and so yeah. when deluges yeah. happen and hailstorms come about uh, guess who they'll hold responsible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, sure. uh, and that that is, uh, and as I said, it's a simplistic way of uh, of explaining it. But but essentially, that's the situation the shaman is in. The shaman is able to heal, maybe, yeah. But what? Can, but if someone yeah. is actually mortally ill and doesn't get healed, is that because the shaman really hates him and didn't do what he yeah. should have done or has he actually caused this disease to happen or this accident or whatever especially you know in hunting uh, and gathering societies where they, you know hunting is a as a hell of an accident prone and uh, crucial like, for survival and yeah. crucial for survival absolutely no you know no no prey no eat and no prey with an a after that because yeah, yeah, uh, because you're yeah. simply dead you're starved absolutely yeah. so yeah. Say for witches and and, and uh, the, you know medicine people or whatever you want to call them, uh, they're always outsiders to some extent. Uh, always needed, yeah. Very often admired, but as I said, never loved. Always feared. And they, have, they have to be to a certain extent outsiders because they have to cross the abyss from time to time, and you don't do that when you are not outside of this. Of well. The group. There, and I, I, I know what you're referring to, and uh, to some extent, I'd agree in that. Uh, well, much as I, as I see it here, is the magic is not really for humans. At least, uh, if you actually want to stay a human, meaning uh, you know that uh, kind of powerless uh, uh, plaything of the gods or the spirits or whatever, uh, who can only you know hope for being 
you know, kind of integrating him or herself into a higher order and, and be very obedient, hopefully uh, be fed until what? Until what? Until you die anyway. <laughs> Powerlessness, as I said. Yeah. Uh, if you if that if that's your career in life, if that's your that's that's all what your life is supposed to be about, then you'll never be a magician. Absolutely, not really. Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, now this this leads me to a question I have to ask you now. Um, you have been in several groups. You started with that group in Bonner, maybe even before, and uh, uh, but also you have define things yourself and for yourself, I get the impression. So you were kind of both, you were the solitary worker and you were part of an egg of several egregores, to put it like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, uh, is that mutually necessary or can one work without the other? Uh, how do you see that? Well... <sighs> Well, there's a brilliant answer to that, and you've probably expected it. The answer is, it depends. <laughs> uh, Are you a lawyer also? <laughs> no, but I but I have a legal mind, at least. Uh, quite a few of my legal opponents uh, found out, <laughs> not to their entire pleasure, I must say. Uh, but, yeah, okay. Um, I think, well, basically... Uh, you know, to boil it down to the to the essence, uh, as it were, it really depends on your uh, on your personal uh, outlook and character. And uh, and uh, uh, I would say, actually, the Bond Group, yeah, we we may have had an egregor at some po later point, but that was actually actually never our aim, mm. and we never act uh, you know actively or proactively worked with that. Yeah. The point yeah. about the the Bond Workshop for Experimental Magic was that we were all individuals who mm. came together as individuals obviously but that's no contradiction in itself yeah sure. uh, because we were you know we had a task to, to do we wanted to investigate magic we wanted to investigate experimental magic not just any magic but experimental mm. magic mm -hmm. uh, but we were not bound as a group we were not bound by oaths of felty and, and loyalty and, uh, and and so on Mm -hmm. uh, not even by secrecy, though we did maintain that uh, generally. I mean, we wouldn't tell other people about it mm -hmm. uh, for all the obvious reasons. But uh, but we were no formal order or a magical organization or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, about a third of us later on actually joined orders, me among mm -hmm. them. I became a member of the Fraternitas Attorney, yeah. and I still am to this very day. And... Um, but your question, your real question is, is that really necessary? And I'd say no, not not by itself, in and of itself. It may be necessary for you or it may be a phase in your life where this is really the best thing you could actually do is join some magical group, uh, work with its egregor or force field or whatever you want to call it, uh, get instructions or get help, uh, get assistance, get someone you know to, to have your back when you're into the more uh, adventurous <laughs> realms of, a magical operation uh, yes. yes that can be very 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 useful mm -hmm. but uh, I know a hell of a lot of people who start uh, myself among them I started out alone Mm. Uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't, in my family there was absolutely no magic uh, there was absolutely no pro occultism or pro esotericism sentiment neither mm -hmm. was there anti Apart yeah. from the fact that, that I was uh, raised uh, in a fairly strong Catholic environment, but oh, once really? I but once I shook sh shaken that off, uh, my parents my, my, my parents didn't object to my getting involved in the occult. I mean, in as much as they were aware of it, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really make them aware of a lot of that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, but the, but they wouldn't have minded, and when they when they knew about it, they did they didn't really care. But uh, neither you know did I have an, a grandmother who was psychic or or an uncle who was channel who who channeled spirits or or uh, who would predict the future or whatever. Nothing is that's all at all so basically i learned my magic from books essentially yeah yeah which is not surprising no but which is not not that common i would say right actually for most of us uh, in the bond group it was actually the standard there okay. were exceptions like harry einstein with whom i 
I've uh, penned that uh, new book of ours, yeah. uh, who came from, who comes from a family where this was uh, qu quite quite a topic, quite a subject, although not in a formal way, but still. Uh, but uh, most people, uh, most members, I'd say uh, out of the 12 or so, 15 members we had, uh, this would apply to about 12 or 13 of them. Uh, with, they were all basically based on book knowledge initially. Obviously, then came practice. Oh, it has to. That, it has of course, to. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but there was no, you know, kind of... Uh, and and, and uh, at that time, um, most of them hadn't been any members of any, any you know, kind of esoteric groups uh, or, or whatever either. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So if it suits you to go be a loner or even in a small informal group of people who, you know, who don't want to set up an organization, who don't want to set up a, an order with degrees and and tests and then uh, this, that and the other or hierarchies, uh, hey, fine, do your thing. And uh, it may be useful, you know, to look around and find out what other people are doing mm -hmm. and learn from other people. I mean, that's the main point. I mean, I've learned from a hell of a lot of people, even if I may not have adopted their their specific type of work or or Weltanschauung or, uh, or, or philosophy or whatever. Uh, but, uh, I mean, hell, I even, even learned uh, stuff from people like Alex Sanders or Hardy Swift here. Yeah? And uh, even though I never became a member, not even remotely, of their, of their specific crowd or, or circle. Sometimes it's in a, in a thick book, half a page that can teach you something, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be a phrase even. And it's a cleverness to to pick that up and not say that that thing is bullshit because I don't like it, but to pick up that phrase, right? Mm. That's right. Yeah. And uh, plus, mm. it may not even be there. It may just be because you're in a, a specific kind of noses or yeah. trance yeah. and suddenly yeah. it speaks to you yeah. as mm. it has spoken to no one else and never will again. Yeah. But that doesn't yeah. matter. That's that's what, what the Jungians would call your personal arcanum. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Definitely. It is, I am afraid I have to go for the two last questions because we could go, go on. Ahead, for go ahead. But we have, uh, we have slowly come to, to uh, a conclusion, but there are two more questions I have to ask you. Sure. One is, and you take the answer in the order that you prefer. We have been speaking about, the, about your, your, your background, about where, where it all comes from. And, and we have heard so and learned so much from you in, through that. And um, so, where is uh, Frater UD going um, in the next few years from that where you are now? And if you know, or would you would you like to go? What what's the path that lies in front of you? And secondly, and that might be related. That's why I say answer in the order you prefer. And um, where does magic, contemporary magic, stand today? And where should it, or where would you like it to go from there? Well, to take the first question first. Um when they asked the Dalai Lama what was going to happen next year, he said, I, hey, I don't even know what kind of tea I'm having this evening. <laughs> How do you ex expect me to know what happens then? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm saying this not to be too jocular about it or frivolous, but, uh, but basically to uh, underline the fact that everything's in flux. I mean, hell, with what with Corona going on. Uh, Thank you. We mentioned it for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What well, with Corona going on? Uh, uh, who, who and, and and even without Corona, I mean, how do how how would you know? How would I know if we live to see the next second? Even sure. so, but uh, but okay on a on a. On a more conservative <laughs> take, I would say what I'm uh, very strongly uh, uh, about these days is actually a investigating noses, uh, mm -hmm. Gnosticism and noses. I mean historical noses, but uh, on an academic scale, but uh, also on an experiential scale. And what's to me more interesting is uh, actually. Uh, the repercussions Gnosis has in uh, in modern day culture and uh, in our view of our way of seeing things, way of handling things, and uh, that's something. For example, uh, one of the one of book, book one book project I have, but I don't 
hey, search me when it, it'll be finished because it'll be a, a fat book, I'm afraid, uh, is actually uh, setting up, uh, you know, a, a book of quotes, like one for every day. So that'll be 365 for 66 with a leap year. And uh, a book of quotes uh, from Gnostic literature, but other stuff as well uh, for, across the board, which will then be used as as uh, what I call gateways to the Gnostic Logos, mm-hmm. where you, mm-hmm. you, which we would use for, for meditation or uh, introspection or whatever you want to call it uh, in order to, to um, uh, latch onto the Gnostic experience. So that, mm-hmm. is, that is one, uh, one major, uh, major um, busy topic for me, which I hope yeah. to pursue the following years. Okay, second thing, more importantly, uh, where will magic go from here? Um, actually, I'm quite, I'm quite optimistic. Mm-hmm. And optimistic in the sense that we've, you know, in the past years we've seen, you know, the rise of talismanic publishing, for instance. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you just in your recent show, uh, which was excellent, by the way, uh, you uh, had David Beth, who I know personally, of course, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, who is, is one of the strong strong proponents of talismanic uh, publishing and does a marvelous job. Sure. And, uh, and there's quite a few others around, uh, um, some competing, some cooperating. Um, uh, what are they actually doing? Actually, they're doing what, what I did in my in my early days as a publisher. You know, they're, they're, there's this small edition, small limited editions, which are usually out by subscription for a small clientele of people who are really serious about this topic. Mm-hmm. Okay, there will also be, when you have these luxury editions, there's also be a bit of speculation. People actually, you know, using it for, uh, because they hope the, that they'll be able to sell it for a profit a few years later. But that's fine. Yeah. Hey, that's that's okay. It's just like an art. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and uh, and the, 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 the quality of the material, some of these publishing, talismanic publishers are actually, you know, spreading is so incredibly high and good I'm really very, very confident that, uh, that especially in the West, I mean, I'm only, only talking Western culture here because I'm not, you know, that well uh, tied up into Eastern culture or contemporary Eastern culture uh, for qualified uh, judgment, uh, that I really think that uh, we're in for a few uh, more surprises in that sector. And uh, that's something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, that's good. Good to hear from somebody like you as well. We have not at all spoken about your books, 40 or more than 40 of them. I must say High Magic, you know, the, the two volumes of High Magic were among those which I started with, even though I'm already, already? 50. <laughs> I started it rather late with them. So, so, but anyway, they are still kind of, well, I wouldn't call them a Bible for obvious reasons, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I really, I really uh, could only say uh, uh, people who start in ceremonial magic should really do that with that. Well, thank, um, you, but, thank you for your kind words. Always appreciate yeah, it. I mean, yeah, of others. But um, as you mentioned, and I will put those links also, of course, in the show notes, there is that new book, which has already appeared in German language which will be with leveling in a, in a few months or when will when will that come out well uh, we don't, I don't have a set uh, publication date yet from the publishers but uh, when I spoke to Bill Krause of uh, the Wellness at the Frankfurt Book Fair in October he said we might uh, be able to publish this next year by now so that so that leads me to the expectation that it'll probably be around uh, from October on we actually wrote it in, in English and in German you know, okay. two, two parallel manuscripts, uh, just just to speed up matters a bit, and yeah. uh, and uh, being oh, can, no. yes, <laughs> and that's the other point. I mean, uh, I mean, I've been a professional uh, translator for more more than half my life, and uh, it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. Plus, I, that that way, I actually know what it's going to be, and uh, and uh, then the people at the Wellens they're always marvelous at uh, at proofreading and editing stuff and so on. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that book is uh, the title is Living Magic, and it's actually a collaborative work. I didn't write it alone. I wrote it together with three of my companions of the Bond Workshop for Experimental Magic. 
Back to Rune. And that is, in, if I say so myself, that is actually quite unusual in magical literature because, <laughs> because you don't, uh, I'm not aware, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any other comparable book in the history of magical literature where four uh, practical, practicing magicians, or more or less practicing, I mean, Josef Knecht uh, wouldn't uh, claim to be a practicing magician these days on the one hand on the other hand he's uh, very much into homeopathy and uh, and he will also always confess that homeopathy is a kind of magic if you take it seriously so uh, that for for practicing magicians after you know 30 years almost yeah more than actually 40 years yeah. after 40 years come together again and not just relate as i said stories from the trenches uh, old uh, war stories and stuff, but uh, but uh, but actually relate what what their current stand on magic is, in various topics, various fields. Uh, you've you've seen the manuscript, so uh, you're probably aware of the list of contents at least, and uh, and uh, and that is actually uh, uh, quite unusual in in its own right. And uh, well, as for the content, what we have to say and what readers will like or not like about it that of course uh, remains to be seen uh, but uh, but it was a lot of fun we took about a year or was more, slightly more than a year to write it together uh, and a uh, lot of lots of discussions I mean we met again for that you know in in, in, yeah. in, in, in meat space <laughs> and in the physical and um, a couple of times and uh, the rest uh, was done you know uh, digitally and uh, it was a lot of fun writing it and uh, I think, uh, I hope, actually, that uh, even more experienced magicians, uh, it's, 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 it's not a how-to-do book, not really. No. It's, uh, okay, uh, in parts it is, but like, for, for example, there's this long long chapter on German letter magic, uh, which hasn't really been yeah. covered in the yeah. English-speaking world. Mm -hmm. And uh, apart from an article I once wrote in The Lamp of Thought, but that was back in the 70s in, uh, in England. And uh, and yeah, I covered it in, in my high magic a bit, but, but uh, that and uh, yeah, there's a bit on my models of magic and how to use them in actual practice but in general it's not a how to do book so much as it is a book that tries to uh, basically background you in terms of uh, what magic is about and also of what magic maybe is not about and I think it's also really, I mean, as much as I know about it, uh, I know the German version, Magie Heute, it's called, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know a little bit about the English version. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's also deepening a lot of stuff that you might already have experienced or at least felt. And I think it's, it's, I think it's very nice. But I go further than you. It wouldn't be normal that four magicians after 40 years even speak to each other. <laughs> well, there's quite a, quite a few uh, people um, with whom I'm not on speaking terms anymore. That's right. Not from not from that Bond group. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, except for one. Okay, never mind. But uh, but um, but uh, yes, you are right about that. Uh, because I mean, feuding is of course uh, another mainstay of organized magic, isn't it? I mean, somebody has to write a book about that one day. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Robin, this has been an enormous pleasure to, as, as I think everybody who listens to this can say, because we, th I think we leave after an hour and a half, which is not oh so um, in very good spirit and still on speaking terms. Absolutely. And, <laughs> And, uh, well, maybe one day we just continue that. That would be nice. I think everybody would enjoy that. Well, you won't, um, you won't find me objecting to that, Rudolf, because as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, I'm serious, you're doing a very, very good job and a very necessary job as far as I see it. And I wish you all the best with your Patreon and all your other corporate sponsorship uh, endeavors because well, uh, I, I, know that the, I, I know that these things don't come for free. Absolutely. And uh, so if, if I can encourage any of your listeners to actually, uh, you know, sponsor uh, – uh, your excellent podcast, please, guys, do. Uh, this, well, this, 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 I didn't ask you to I, say no, that. you didn't, and, and, I, and I'm not, and I'm not getting a cut as yet. Exactly. <laughs> we'll speak about that when the microphone is off. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks so much, Rodrigo, and uh, well, good luck for all your projects, and uh, Thank you. thanks for this lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
liten skog Han vill men kan inte sova Hungen river hans varje buk Och det är kallt i hans stova Listening to the Wolf Song by Jonna Jinton, where she worked on the text from a lullaby from Astrid Grinkins Ronja, the Robber's Daughter. The Wolf Song by Jonna Jinton. And before that, you were listening to a wonderful and lengthy interview with Frater Judy and I. Really would like to thank him for all the time he gave to me for that nice mention about being a patron of this show as well. Thanks. Yes, I did really not ask him to do that, but he did it all by himself. Um, maybe you'll help me with that. Okay. Um, well, thank you for being with me today. We are coming to the end of this long episode. You might have realized that since last time I am trying to do this talks between the parts of the interview and all the announcements in a bit the more free way. I hope you like it. Let me know if that's okay for you. And I script a bit less my talks and do them a bit more freely, feel more secure than maybe three years ago. Um, 
And well, um, I hope that you again, that you all stay healthy, that you will all be fine when we next will be together in a week. And what's on in a week? Well, um, in a week time, again, an exciting guest, I believe. Um, somebody very special will be my guest on episode 13. And that is Anthony Peak. Anthony Peak. Uh, British, well, writer, researcher, uh, author, and um, he is an amazing guy. He wrote recently that book, The Hidden Universe, and that actually inspired me to invite him to be my guest here next time. You can find out about, more about him when you read on the Thought Hermes podcast uh, website, thoughthermes.com, a little bit about the announcement of next week's show. And I'm sure Anthony will be a great opener of your mind like he was for me. Right. One other reminder, do not forget, I told you already, we have a question and answer episode planned with David Beth. All the questions that arose after last week's show, please send them to info at thoughthermes.com or via Facebook to me. We'll collect them until Easter, until April 10. And after that, we shall make that special Q&A episode with David for your pleasure. Thank you for being with me today. Hope to see you again next week, next time on the Thermis podcast. But for today, I can only say, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.